live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. We've seen a lot of weird things take place during the Super Bowl pregame show. When you've got to fill hours upon hours of time in some cases, you're going to see some bizarre things that might not make a whole lot of sense. For example, at Super Bowl 27, one of the final things shown before the start of that Super Bowl was OJ Simpson playing Mike Dicka in a video game, where we learned that Mike Dicka truly stuck at video games if he allowed the Bills to actually beat the Cowboys in the Super Bowl. At Super Bowl 20, we had an entire minute of silence. I meant to do a future video on the history of that, because this literally was just a minute where nothing was happening. And at Super Bowl 23, we had the infamous Diet Pepsi Talent Challenge, where NFL players participated in a talent show that failed absolutely miserably. You can learn more about that train wreck by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But I promise you that as bizarre and as weird as all those things were, there isn't a whole lot that can compare it to this. Because at Super Bowl 8, a whopping 20% of the pregame show was an animated musical involving a singing football. No, I'm not making that up. CBS had a bold idea for the game that we've never seen before the Super Bowl and have never seen since, and for good reason. And this is the story behind what might just be, in the over half century long history of the Super Bowl, the strangest and weirdest broadcasting decision ever. Before I talk about the actual broadcast, because there is a lot to talk about here, we need some context to understand why CBS was doing this and how the landscape of the pregame show looked at that time so we can see how this fit in. And before we go any further, I want to say that if you want to watch this entire segment uninterrupted, I have an unlisted link in the description where you can check it out. Most industries are copycat industries. When one company does something unique and innovative, other companies try to do the same thing. And the television industry is no different. Fox created the score bug in the 90s that permanently stays on the screen. And now, every network has their own score bug because the idea was that successful. ESPN implemented a ticker showing the scores in sporting news, and now, practically every station has a news ticker. And CBS was no different. Because in 1973, rival network NBC introduced an absolute game changer. After NBC got the rights to the NHL during the 1972-73 season, one of the bosses over there, Scotty Connell, realized that a lot of people didn't know the rules of hockey and were not familiar with the sport. Remember that during this time, the NHL was expanding rapidly. After having six teams in 1966, with all the teams being primarily located in the Northeast plus Detroit and Chicago, by this point, there were 16 teams in all different areas of the country, including the West with the California Golden Seals and Los Angeles Kings, and the South with the Atlanta Flames. NBC needed a creative and innovative way to get people to understand the sport, because some of the rules, such as icing, can be incredibly intimidating to a new viewer looking to grasp what hockey is all about. And with that, NBC worked with Hanna-Barbera to create Peter Puck. In between periods, during intermission, the cartoon Puck would appear on the screen and would explain something about hockey. Sometimes it would be the icing rule. Sometimes it'd be the equipment and the format of the game. Sometimes it would be about the roles of different positions on the ice. And to this day, Peter Puck is remembered pretty fondly. Even though Peter Puck didn't last very long, as NBC lost the rights to the NHL after the 1974-75 season, people remember Peter Puck. The cartoons were informative, they accomplished their goal, and the attempts at humor were actually not bad and not forced. Peter Puck even made a revival in the 2000s, and you can buy merchandise to this day with Peter Puck on it. NBC had a hit on its hands, and CBS figured that they needed to counter it with a cartoon of their own. And for Super Bowl VIII, that's where they had an idea. Back in the mid-1970s, the Super Bowl was not the juggernaut that it is today. Even though the game got high TV ratings and viewership, with the game drawing an average television audience of 51 million viewers and a peak television audience of 63 million viewers, other leagues had no problem going up against the Super Bowl. It wasn't really until the Super Bowl moved to prime time for Super Bowl 12 in 1978 that everything started to change. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And the same thing applied to the pregame show. There was nothing flashy or special about the shows, and most of the studio segments were pre-taped. The pregame show for Super Bowl 56 on NBC will be six hours long. This pregame show on CBS for Super Bowl 8, it was just 30 minutes long. It's hard to imagine a pregame show for the Super Bowl that's only 30 minutes in length. What do you talk about in those 30 minutes? You could talk about the matchup taking place. You could talk about how Houston is hosting for the first time and what they're doing to get ready for the game. You could talk about the giant controversy involving the Vikings getting significantly worse practice facilities than the Dolphins. You could interview players and coaches. You could talk about the incredible meeting between the two teams the last time they met in 1972, when the Dolphins trailed 14 to six in the fourth quarter and scored 10 on answer to win 16 to 14. There were a lot of different avenues you could go to fill these 30 minutes, or really 23 minutes when you take commercials into account. So what route did CBS decide to go with to fill this limited amount of time? 
They went with the cartoon musical route. CBS contacted Cambria Productions, best known for their cheap animation style on a tight budget, to make something for this pregame show of theirs to try and compete with Peter Puck and to have an animated mascot of their own. If you've heard of Cambria, they were the same studio behind some cartoons in the late 1950s and early 1960s, like Clutch Cargo, Space Angel, Captain Fathom, and most notably, the new Three Stooges. And now, they were going to do one of their biggest projects yet, a musical number 20 minutes before kickoff of Super Bowl VIII in front of that large television audience with an animated football voiced by Hal Smith, who had done animated voiceover work before with Owl in Winnie the Pooh. And the end result? An absolutely bizarre cartoon that probably left the 50 or so million people watching and sitting in front of their television sets, scratching their heads. As the cartoon starts off with an establishing shot of the Hall of Fame, we're introduced to the main character in our story, Freddy Football. And from the very first line, you can tell there might be a problem here. You know, before a really big game, I like to come down here and meditate. Get myself into the proper mood. You just gotta be the best if you intend to make the Hall of Fame. Before a really big game, then I can come down here and meditate. I think you missed a few words in there. I didn't edit anything or cut anything out. That is legitimately how it starts. When the first sentence leaves you scratching your head because it's not a complete thought, or because something got chopped out abruptly, that is a really bad sign. However, after that, Freddie busts into song and talks about the greatness of the Hall of Fame. And I apologize in advance, because the worst and most infuriating part about this cartoon, without a doubt, is the fact that the song is ridiculously catchy. In the fabulous Hall of Fame, every name you see here has answered the Call of Fame. Here on the walls are the records, here for the whole world to see. They play the song a few times throughout the cartoon, but holy cow, I hate how I cannot get this out of my head. And I don't think I ever will. But after the first of many songs is done, we're introduced to one of the footballs in the Hall of Fame, named Incrediball. Nice play on words there. And it's, well, it's kind of confusing. This is my great-grandfather, Incrediball. He invented the fumble. How did you do it, great-grandfather? I'm sorry, how is that a good thing? How is creating the fumble something that should be celebrated? It's like if the NBA did something like this and had a talking basketball whose claim to fame was creating the air ball, or a talking baseball whose claim to fame was creating the error. I get it if you're saying that this football created the field goal or the forward pass or something else, but you pick the worst thing that can happen to a player during a football game, and something that will keep you out of the Hall of Fame if you do it too much. It's a bit of a weird choice, and trust me, there's a lot of weird choices in this cartoon, such as immediately after, when, I can't believe this is a real sentence, the old talking football rants about having sex with women during training camp. And when you're in training, don't fool around with the ladies. Right. Why, you footballs out there listening to me, don't mess around while you're in training. You'll get shin splints. Right. Why, lose your breath. Right. Why, fall down. Right. I told you this was going to be weird. One of the other weird things about this cartoon is just how much they get wrong. Obviously, I'm not talking about the talking footballs. I mean actual, factual, and historical information that is just blatantly wrong. The very first person that they mention as being a part of the Hall of Fame is Walter Camp. Eight football historically is a champ. Back to the days of Walter Camp. The only problem? Walter Camp isn't in the Hall of Fame. Don't get me wrong, he absolutely should be. The man literally created the sport that we know today, and is known as the father of American football. But he's not in the Hall. And this isn't the only factual error in the video, as we will find out later. But after we move past Incrediball's rant, we move to our next character. And this is my uncle, Eddie Ball. I'm sorry, Eddie Ball? Really? You knew what you were doing. Don't try to deny it. You knew exactly what you were doing when you named a character Eddie Ball. Fair play. I can respect it. No clue how you got that one past the CBS filters, but well done. Legitimately got a chuckle out of that. Unfortunately, we have yet another factual piece that is wrong, and is wrong for no reason. Jim Thorpe once drop kicked him 75 yards for a field goal. Look, Jim Thorpe is one of the greatest athletes in American history, and he was instrumental in pro football, with accomplishments and accolades galore. However, as good as he was, he never drop kicked a football 75 yards. Considering the longest field goal in NFL history at the time was Tom Dempsey's 63 yard kick in 1970 with the New Orleans Saints to beat the Detroit Lions, it's probably physically impossible to drop kick a football 75 yards. At least with the Waller Camp line, it was done to fit a rhyming scheme. There was no reason to lie here. Why not say an actual distance? Why make something up for no reason? But whatever, because after the football rants about the fact that the dropkick is no longer a thing, we move on to our next character, 
Timothy. Why they weren't consistent with the naming and didn't go with something like Unbelievable or Impossible, I'm not sure. Guess they used all their brain power on Eddie Ball. And Timothy has something to say about how soft the game is today. And with no artificial turf either. What happened to the grass? Bring back the grass! Bring back real mud! And what about the flying wedge? The water boy. This is what I don't get at all about this spot. Super Bowl 8 was being played at Rice Stadium, which is a venue with, you guessed it, artificial turf. So why would you devote an entire segment to a guy ranting about how stupid artificial turf is, and how back in my day, football used to be played on grass, and the field was 100 yards uphill both ways? I just don't get it. This whole segment is just the Simpsons equivalent of Old Man Yells a Cloud. This is like if before a college football game, the announcers for that game were talking about how meaningless the game is, how it's just a glorified exhibition, and that this isn't real football. Gee, way to kill the excitement and make this game seem illegitimate. After some more singing, and after we're introduced to every football in the hall, you'd think we'd be done. But nope, we're only halfway there. Because now, Freddy talks about how coaches are an important part of the Hall of Fame. But he does this in such a weird way that I have a major issue with. Making the Hall of Fame is not easy for a coach. The percentages are all against it. Percentages, percentages. You've got to play percentages. Obviously, your odds of making the Hall of Fame are not good no matter who you are. But the part that bothers me is that it's another factual error. At the time, there were 11 coaches in the Hall of Fame. There were 66 players and owners in the Hall of Fame. Now, I don't have the exact numbers, but I'd be willing to wager a pretty hefty sum of money that there was a greater percentage of coaches who made the Hall than players, seeing as there were only about 12 head coaches a year for most of the NFL's history at that point, and each team had a roster of 35 or 40 players. So if we're playing the percentages, this whole song makes no sense to contradicts itself. Now, you might be asking yourself why I'm looking so deeply into the lyrics of a song from the 1970s with a cartoon football. And that's because, well, I'm Jaguar Gator 9. Did you expect anything less at this point? And to wrap it all up, we have two songs that have nothing to do with anything. One of them is how important the fans are to the game, but the other one is about Freddy Football being madly in love with his center. Again, I'm not making that up, but I'll just spare you your eardrums and skip that one. And with that, after another repeating of the main theme, the segment mercifully ends. Thank God. This was not like Masters of the Gridiron, which is the movie that the Browns made that was incredibly weird, but that I genuinely enjoyed. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. This cartoon was painful to get through. You feel every bit of the six and a half minutes that this cartoon goes on, and I legitimately could not watch it in one sitting. Again, the full video is in the description, but I'm not kidding when I say it is brutal to watch. I think the confusing part about this entire thing when watching it is the basic question that everyone has to ask themselves when creating anything. Who is this for? Peter Puck, for instance, was clearly for those who were unfamiliar with the rules of the sport. Freddy Football, though, is not for anyone. It's not for football fans, because again, even though I like musicals, 20 minutes before the Super Bowl, I don't want to be watching a musical number. I want to focus on the game that's about to take place. It's not for the non-football fans, because the references being made were to things that non-football fans have no idea about and cannot relate to. Non-football fans have no idea why a football is ranting about the dropkick not being a thing anymore, or why Burt Bell is in the hall. They had no idea who their audience was here. Now, you might be saying to yourself, wait a minute. This is clearly meant as an advertisement for the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and this was designed as a way to get people interested in the hall and to make a visit. However, if that was the case, then it failed miserably. Why do I say that? It does even have anything to do with the fact that a lot of the lines in the musical were factually incorrect. Rather, it's a completely different reason. Because not once in this entire musical number did they ever say where the Hall of Fame was located. Not once was there even a subtitle on the screen that said Cannon, Ohio. Not once did Freddy Football make any mention of where he was. And the Hall of Fame was a relatively new thing. It was only established in 1963. And when you remember who the average audience member is at the Super Bowl, they have no idea where the Hall is. And this was before the internet, so you couldn't just look up where the Hall of Fame was. What kind of advertisement for a relatively new, and to the average person watching the game, unknown location doesn't even reveal where the place is? So if that was the goal, holy cow, it failed miserably. Regardless, Freddy Football was a failure. There's a reason you don't see Freddy Football merchandise being sold, there's a reason you probably don't have any recollection of this, and there's a reason that sketches involving Freddy Football never aired again after this. This was a one-shot deal. Unlike Peter Puck, where the segment had a shelf life, the shelf life for Freddy Football was about as long as the Vikings were realistically in that Super Bowl. And more than 50 years later, Freddy Football's lasting legacy is being one of the weirdest things to ever air at the Super Bowl. I don't think Tony Baselli, Sam Mills, Richard Seymour, and all of those guys are going to be seeing Freddy Football in August.
Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. If you want to see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.